what I'm going to do today is to take up the topic of scheduling with uh, a different example from the one that we considered last time. So basically what we did was uh, we were previously looking at some kind of an IIR filter, uh, second order uh, section, right, which had both uh, forward as well as feedback loops and you know, I mean, you could uh, sort of see how the overall problem of folding could be solved on such a system, right? And what I mean by folding is, if you are given that, you know, you have a certain folding order, that is a certain number of time steps within which to execute a, a set of operations and some limited amount of hardware, and you are given the folding set, that is to say the sequence of operations on each of those pieces of hardware, we discuss basically how you can go about implementing it on that hardware, right? So what kind of connections would be needed? How many physical registers would you need to implement and so on, all that we saw. And at the end of the last session, we basically sort of got a flavor of how we might have come up with those numbers, right? The fact that the folding sequences are not somehow magical or random, right? There is meaning to them. There is some reason why those numbers come up in a particular sequence. And what we are going to do now is basically go deeper into that, right? How do you actually solve that problem of scheduling in general, okay? The example that I'm going to take up is, you know, once again, this is a sort of uh, classic example, right? And uh, a good treatment of this is uh, in the book, Synthesis and Optimization of Digital Circuits. I, I think I've put a link to this in the, Moodle, but if not, you know, this is by Giovanni Di Michelli, or professor at Stanford. Uh, it's an old book, right? 1993. So it's like 25 years or 27 years old at this point. But it doesn't matter. The point is that, you know, a lot of the theory that we are discussing over here was already very mature and stable by this point in time. Okay. So even this example, of course, this particular, you know, the differential equation solver example is even older. It's from, from the mid eighties, right? And it is still useful from the point of view of explaining the steps that are involved in actually taking, you know, some kind of a problem and uh, casting it into a form, which can actually be, uh, you know, systematically scheduled and implemented on hardware. Okay. So you don't need to get this book. If you do have a copy, then, you know, uh, I'm, I'm basically trying to cover most of the material which is there, but the book itself is far more detailed. I mean, it goes into a lot of details on different kinds of scheduling algorithms, uh, which I'm not going to get into, right? And part of the reason I'm not getting, getting into it is, you know, what I told at the beginning of the course. The purpose of this course is not so much to teach you the details of the algorithms. It is more to teach you of uh, you know, an idea of what is happening in these situations so that as and when you are actually involved in designing a system, you have that at the back of your mind and that hopefully helps you to design better. Okay. So what is this differential equation solver, right? The, uh, the differential equation that I'm talking about is summarized in this equation. Y double prime plus C1 X Y prime plus C2 Y is equal to zero, right? Where C1 and C2 are some constants, arbitrary constants, and X is an independent variable, right? So it's basically Y is sort of a function of X, you can say, right? So Y is a function of X that you are trying to solve for. And what you have is some initial conditions, right? So for example, we start from X equal to zero. And at that point, you are given what are the values of Y of zero and Y prime of zero, okay? And what you want to do is now sort of find y as a function of x, right, starting from this point. And the approach that we are going to follow is to say that, look, rather than, I mean, maybe it's possible to solve this analytically, but we are interested in writing a program to solve it. In other words, we want to basically do numerical integration. Okay. So how does a numerical integration, what would the code for it look like, right? Uh, how would the hardware for it look like and how would we implement something like this is essentially the question that we are trying to solve. So the approach that we are going to do is to say we will integrate this numerically over some range x starting at zero, right? Because uh, that's where we have the initial condition and going up to some value a, 
right? Where a is again given to us as a constant, right? It is some value that is uh, given to us, uh, and we need to evaluate the value of y at a by doing this numerical integration. So, in order to do this, the way that we would like to go about it is, you know, can we sort of write a program to solve this? Okay. And in order to do that, what we are going to do is to basically introduce this new sort of intermediate variable u, right, is equal to y prime. This is just some thing to make it easier for us to write the computation, right? And what happens with this intermediate variable? Now the equation basically becomes c one x u. It was y prime, so I've just directly you know dropped uh, u in place of y prime. But the interesting thing over here, here is now y double prime is equal to u prime, right? So this prime essentially is just d by dx, right? So what I'm saying is dy by dx is equal to u, and d square y by dx squared is equal to u double prime. Okay, uh, sorry, u prime. Y double prime is equal to u prime. So if I now use this, I can rewrite this by saying u prime plus c one x u plus c two y is equal to zero, which in turn can be rewritten as this expression out here. Okay. So now, how does this help me? Right. Effectively, what I'm saying is, now I have got an expression for how x. Changes, right? I am basically interested in x changing from zero to a, and what I am going to do is take some step of uh, increment for x and keep adding it to x until it goes from zero to a. While I do that, I can compute u prime. What do I need for that? I know the present value of x, the present value of u, and the present value of y, right? At x equal to zero, I know what y of zero and y prime of zero, that is u of zero, are. So I know the all the initial values. I can calculate u prime, and once I know u prime, I can essentially say that u new value is equal to the old value plus du by dx into dx. Okay. This is essentially the core of numerical integration, right? Where du by dx is basically u prime. Okay, which means that I can now come up with three so-called update equations: x is equal to x plus dx, u is equal to u plus u prime dx, which, when I substitute u prime using the equation I've got, becomes u minus c1 x u dx minus c2 y dx. And y is equal to y plus y prime dx. Okay, so that's equal to y plus u into dx because after all, y prime by our definition is u. Okay, so now this is interesting because essentially what we have got is we have initial conditions, right? Initial values at x equal to zero, no. Right, the initial value of x is of course x equal to zero. The y and u values I'm assuming are given. Okay, everything else, the c1, c2 are constants. Therefore, I can now at the value dx, I can compute all of these things. Use that value in turn to compute the value at 2dx, then at 3dx, 4dx, and so on until I reach a, which is my limit of integration. Okay, how would I write a program? For something like this, right? Uh, before we get into the program, I'm also going to sort of just make an assumption on the kind of hardware that's available to me, right? The, this assumption is not so much required for writing the program. It is required for the next step beyond that, which is basically going to be how do I actually build a schedule for this program, right? But what I'm going to assume for now is that I have two types of hardware available to me. One is a multiply type of hardware. Right, which can basically take in two numbers and multiply them and give an output, and it has a one cycle latency. Right? What does one cycle latency mean? It basically means that you know it, it's a combinational unit with a register at the end. Okay, so it does the multiplication, but the output of the multiplication is available in the next clock cycle.
Okay, so it's stored into a register and available in the next clock cycle. Similarly, there is an A type hardware unit, which is capable of doing not just addition, but also subtraction and comparison of numbers, because after all, logically, they are almost the same operation, right? So add, subtract and compare. There is very little extra hardware required to do all three compared to doing any one of them. So usually they are just considered as one sort of simple ALU type unit. Okay. Once again, that's also I'm going to assume on one cycle latency. So what would my code look like, right? So what I'm doing over here is once again, bringing in a temporary variable, right? Which I'll call Excel and say Excel is equal to X plus DX. Okay. And what do I do after doing Excel is equal to X plus DX? I can just do X is equal to Excel. Okay. That is the update for the next iteration, right? What that means is I can now compute UL is equal to whatever this complicated looking expression, which is exactly the expression that I had derived right from the equation, right? So UL is now going to be equal to all of this U minus C1 into X into U into DX minus C2 into Y into DX. Okay. The important thing to keep in mind is this is the same value of X, not yet updated. Right? The update happens over here. Okay. So in other words, when I'm calculating UL, I'm still using the old value of X, not yet the updated value. That is why I brought in that temporary variable. Right? This is sort of a standard technique that you would use in code, right? If we were using very log, of course, you know, there is this concept of non-blocking assignments and maybe we would not need to do this. Right? We could just use non-blocking assignments, but I'm not talking about that. I'm actually talking about literally something like C code. Okay. And then I would, you know, bring in this temporary variable assign it, and then update it at the end. And finally, y, y L is equal to Y plus U into DX because U is Y prime. Okay. Now all of this is basically one step through the numerical integration. I need to keep on doing this and what is my termination condition going to be? That is, when do I stop doing this? I need to find out when this X plus DX, right, has gone from zero up to A, right? In other words, when it reaches A, I stop this entire iteration. So I put a while loop around it, okay? So while X is less than A, I do this these are essentially the computations and this is just the update, right? So the update part of it is not even, you know, it does not involve any hardware. Effectively, you can think of it by saying that, you know, it's just that whatever was there coming out of this basically goes into some uh, register and gets saved over there. Okay. So now let's look a little more closely at this expression, at this uh, you know piece of code that we have got, right? We can identify that there are six multiplication operations that are being performed. Okay. And <clears throat> how did I get six? I basically I'm just counting the number of star operations present in the code, right? So I've written C1 into X into U into DX, right? I'm assuming that I have a multiplier capable of multiplying two things at once. Therefore, I will just basically be doing them repeatedly one after the other. I would first do C1 into X. Maybe after that, I would multiply by U, then multiply by DX, right? So either way, whichever way I do it, whichever order I do it, I would end up needing three multiplications over there. Similarly, C2 into Y into DX would need two multiplications, okay? So overall, what I have over here is six multiplications to be performed. Right now, if you are looking closely at this, you might, uh, you know, notice, for example, that something like this u into dx, right, is actually the same, right? It occurs twice, okay. But I'm going to ignore the fact that there is something a common expression over here and assume 
two multiplications need to be done. Right? In other words, if I had the code just being, you know, literally uh, the computer was looking at the code as I have written it line by line and executing it, it would actually end up doing six multiplications. Right? In practice, of course, you know, especially those of you who have done a course on compilers or have looked at how a compiler works, you would clearly say, you know, the u into dx at least should never be done twice, right? In fact, if you look more closely at it, you might find that, you know, because after all, dx and c1 and c2 are all constants, you can do some of the multiplications ahead of time outside the while loop, right? All, all of those are optimizations, right? They are not something that is fundamental to how a code gets converted into hardware. Therefore, I'm leaving them aside. I'm going to ignore all of those kind of optimizations for now. We will get to them when we talk about how a compiler works, which will basically come up after this material that we are covering now. Okay. So in other words, to keep it simple, right now what I'm assuming is that this code as it stands will result in six multiplications explicitly. Okay. What about the other type of operations? We have additions, uh, subtraction and comparison. So you can see that there is this comparison out here, right? X less than A. And then there are the pluses and minuses. I've just counted all of them and you end up with add, subtract, comparison, right? Grouped all of them together. So the number of multiplications that I have over here is six and the number of add, subtract, comparisons is five. 